The Fundamental Theorem of Algebra and Corollary. Say we have a polynomial. Here we have f of x, and we've got a big polynomial over here, and we know it's a quintic. It's a fifth degree polynomial to degree five, because that's my highest power right there is to the fifth power. I also know that my leading coefficient, which is four here, is positive. So I know a little bit about this polynomial before I even begin. I know its end behavior is gonna be in opposite directions because it's an odd degree polynomial. And I also even know what directions those are going to be because it's a positive leading coefficient. So my positive values more and more on my x-axis are going to lead to positive values on my y. And if I go negative on my x-axis, it's going to lead to negative values on my y. So the fundamental theorem of algebra and the corollary actually states that this polynomial has a total of five roots. Now we don't really know what this middle looks like. We know that the middle does something, but it could do something like this, where it only goes through that x-axis once, or it could go up to five times through that axis. I know it has a total of five zeros. And now you think maybe, wait a minute, right here it's only going through once. But those zeros or those roots the imaginary ones are included as well. So that's what the fundamental theorem of algebra and its corollary state, that if I have a fifth degree polynomial, I know it's gonna have five roots. Now, not all of those roots will be real roots. Some of them may be imaginary. And what I mean by real roots are like the square root of five or two or negative one. Those are all real. Any ones that include I would be imaginary and they wouldn't show up on our x-axis. Also, I know, because it's an odd degree polynomial, that it's got to cross that x-axis at least once. So one of those roots has to be real. And that's because my end behavior is doing different things. So eventually, to get to this one, I'm going to have to go through that x-axis at least once. And it might be more. Descartes' rule of signs. Now, Descartes' rule of signs kind of helps us determine the nature of the roots, whether they're going to be positive or negative or include imaginary number in it. And he did a lot of research on what those polynomials would behave like and found that the number of positive real zeros is determined by the number of sign changes between the terms of f of x. So it's either that number or down by a factor of 2. So you keep subtracting 2. So let's look at what that means. So the number of positive real zeros is determined by the number of sign changes. So right here, I have a positive. Here's a positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. So if we look at when the sign changes, it's starting positive, it keeps going positive. And right here, we have a sign change. It's going from positive to negative. And here again, another sign change, positive or negative to positive. And here, another sign change positive to negative, and again, another one. So Descartes' rule of signs tell us that if we're looking at our positive roots, I know that I either have four positive real zeros or down by a factor of two. I could have two or I could have zero real zeros. Um, so those are my possibilities, but I know I have a total of five roots. So what about the negative possibilities, the negative real roots? Well, for that, we look at f of negative x. So the same kind of thing. We have our polynomial. The number of negative real zeros is determined by the sign changes in f of negative x. So that's where we're substituting a negative x in for every x, or less by a factor of 2. So let's just go over how we would determine what f of negative x was is. So we just replace all the x's with a negative x and we go ahead and take them to that power. So negative x to the fifth power, you're multiplying negative x times negative x times negative x times negative x times negative x and you're going to end up with negative x to the fifth power. So that sign is going to be negative. Over here when we have x times x times x times x, we're going to have positive x. So that's going to be the same as plus 3x to the fourth. And here we have an odd power again, which means that's going to yield a negative x cubed, and a negative times a negative is going to give me that positive. And over here, when we take negative x squared, negative x times negative x, that's just the same as positive x squared, so it doesn't change this sign. Over here, negative 6 times negative x is going to give me a positive 6x plus 1. 
Now notice the only time my signs are changing from f of x is when I have an odd degree. And that's because when I have an odd degree, that negative shows up. If I have a, an even degree, the negative and negative make a positive. Okay, so here's my negative f of x. And I'm again gonna look at sign changes. So here I have a negative sign, and then I change right here to a positive sign. And then I keep going positive, so I haven't changed. Positive, positive, positive. And so I know that my negative roots are only gonna be one. There's only one sign change. Now if I were go to go back by a factor of two, I would get in the negatives. And so I know that there's only one negative real root. Now that tells me something interesting. That tells me that on the x-axis, there's gonna be one negative place where it crosses for sure. Positive, I don't really know. I have lots of possibilities here. I know my total has to be five. Now for the imaginary ones, you actually use all of this to help you determine how many imaginary roots you're going to have. You've got a lot of possibilities here. So we could have four positive real roots, one negative root, we have that every time, and that's a total of five. So we could have zero imaginary, that's a possibility. Well, we could have two positive real roots, and we know we have one negative real root, so that's a total of three, but we need five, so we have to have a two here. So that would give us a total of five zeros. Well, we could have zero positive real roots and one negative. That would leave us with four, having to have four imaginary roots. And so that's how we determine how many imaginary roots we have. So let's take a look at how we can use this to help us find um, some of our roots here. So here we have a polynomial, and um, this is a quartic this time instead of a quintic. So we know the end behavior is going to be the same. So it doesn't have to cross that x-axis. So given this polynomial, and also given that x plus four and x minus one are factors, we wanna find all of the zeros. Well, we immediately know two of the zeros, and that's by the factor theorem, which we covered before. We know that um, x is equal to negative four and x is equal to one have to be zeros by the factor theorem. So now we wanna find the rest of the zeros. So we know we have to have a total of four because that exponent is four right there. And let's look at our positive real roots. So we're gonna look for sign changes again here. So that's positive, positive, oh, sign change right here. That's negative, 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 and another sign change. So we have two total sign changes. So our positive real roots could be two or it could be zero. So I'm subtracting two to get to that zero. Now to look at our negative real roots, we have to plug in a negative x for every x. So when we do that and we have a negative x to the fourth, that just stays x to the fourth. However, when we do that with x to the third, that becomes a negative x to the third and it changes. So that's negative two x. Minus 13 x squared, plugging in a negative x there and squaring it, it's just gonna be the same as x squared. And then 14 times negative x is gonna give us, or negative 14 times negative x is gonna give us a positive 14, and then plus 24. Now we can check out the sign changes. Well here, positive, so we have positive to a negative, that's a sign change, and negative to a positive, that's another sign change. So we have a possibility of having two or zero. Okay, so that's not really helping us a whole lot. We don't know for sure whether we have, have um, positive or negative real ones, but let's take a look at what our imaginary ones would be. So we have the possibility of having two positive. If we have two positive, we could either have two real negative which would give us zero imaginary, or we could have two positive and zero negative, so that would give me two, and the other way I could get two was having two negative and zero positive. I also could have zero positive real, real roots and zero positive negative roots, and that would give me a total of four imaginary roots. Now I know I don't have four imaginary roots because I know negative four and one are all are zeros. So I know I at least have one here and one here. So I'm guessing that I'm gonna have another positive and another negative. All right, so let's take a look at how we're going to do that. So we can use our synthetic division to help us break down this polynomial into its factors. So first we're gonna divide by a negative four. So really we're dividing this whole polynomial 
by x plus 4. And we can do that using synthetic division. So I have a negative 4 here. That's the opposite of what's ever right here. I have a negative 4. And these numbers, remember, come from the coefficients in front of my greater polynomial. And then when I do synthetic division, I bring down the 1. 1 times negative 4 is negative 4. Add them together, and I have a negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 4 is 8. Add them together. Negative 5. Negative 5 times negative 4 is 20. Add them together, and a 6. 6 times negative 4 is negative 24. Add them together, and I get a 0. Now, I expect this. If I didn't get a 0, I probably wrote something down incorrectly because it told me that x plus 4 is a root. Now, why, you ask, do I divide that? Well, it's to get this right here. This is called the depressed polynomial. And not because it's sad, but because it's smaller. So if we could actually rewrite this with our x's back in line there. And so instead of an x to the fourth, we're not going to start with x to the fourth anymore because we already divided this by an x. So we start with x to the third, and that's the coefficient. That 1 is in front of the x to the third. Minus 2x squared minus 5x plus 6. Now, I can rewrite this polynomial in terms of two factors. Now, this factor is not simplified down here, but that's a better, better looking thing than this, right? I'm a little bit more simplified. So if I can factor this, I can find even more factors. In fact, I'm going to use this just to go ahead and make an even smaller depressed polynomial by dividing this by x minus 1. x minus 1 has to go into this whole polynomial which is also this polynomial. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Now dividing by x minus 1, I take the 1 here. I'm using this polynomial now. So I have a negative 1, a negative 2, negative 5, and a 6. Dividing by 1, I'm expecting a 0 because it said x minus 1 is a root. Bring down the 1, multiply. 1 times 1 is 1. Add negative 1. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. Add negative 6. Negative 6 times 1 is negative 6. Oops. Add, and I have a 0. Now this gives me an even more depressed polynomial, which I can rewrite down here as x squared minus x minus 6. Now this is nice because I can factor this. And this is plus 2. Okay, so this actually factors to x minus 3 and x plus 2. Because when I multiply them together, I get a negative 6, add them together, and I get that negative x. And now I can go ahead and find all of my factors with whatever makes this 0. So I know that that's going to be a negative 4, a negative 2, a 1, and a 3. And look, I have two negatives and two positive real roots. No imaginaries. So this is my actual case with a total of four roots. Okay, so let's look at the complex conjugate theorem. So if I have a polynomial and I know that 4, four minus i is a root and I want to find all of the zeros, well, I can. I can go ahead and divide that by negative 4, I, I can take that 4 minus i and do synthetic division, but it's kind of messy. So something you should always know about um, imaginary numbers is that if this is a root, its conjugate is also a root. Now that makes sense because when you're doing the quadratic formula, you always have that plus or minus in there. And so it's always going to have its conjugate as a root. So in this case, 4 plus i. So if 4 minus i is a root and 4 plus i is a root, we know that the factors x minus 4 minus i and x minus 4 plus i are factors of this right here. So, And we know that by the factor theorem. This is a factor of f of x and this is a factor of f of x. So the con complex conjugate theorem says if a plus bi is a 0, then a minus bi is also a 0. And that comes in handy if you're trying to find out all the zeros. So if we're trying to find all the zeros of this, we know there's a total of three. We already know two of them, but how do you find the third? Okay, so here we have our same polynomial. We know this is a factor and this is a factor. 
Now I want to take you back to a little bit simpler math so you can kind of see how that's all going to work out. So if we have the number 36 and we know 2 is a factor of 36, we also know 9 is a factor of 36, if we multiply 2 times 9, that also has to be a factor of 36. You can kind of think of factor trees when you're thinking of this. So 2 times 9 is also a factor. So if this is a factor and this is a factor, then when we multiply them together, that will also be a factor of this polynomial. So when we multiply them together, I'm going to go ahead and distribute this negative here and here. So I get x minus 4 plus i, and then here I have x minus 4 minus i. And then I'm going to regroup it in a different way that helps me kind of see an easier way to multiply this all out. Now you could just multiply all three terms by all three terms, but grouping it this way is going to help me make it a little bit easier. So I can see that this is going to lead to my difference of squares. So when I multiply x, to the, x minus 4 times x minus 4, I get x minus 4 squared. Now if I look at my outside and my insides, I can see that I get negative i times this and positive i times the same thing. So those are going to cancel or give me a 0. Multiplying i times negative i is going to give me a negative i squared. So then this actually leads to a perfect trinomial. If I were to FOIL this out, and I would have x squared minus 8x plus 16. And this right here is minus i squared is negative 1, so minus negative 1. It's going to give me a plus 1 here. Adding the 1 and the 16, I have 17. This is a factor of this original polynomial. This times some other factor is going to give us this polynomial that has three total zeros. So in order to find out what that is, I can actually do a long division problem. I can divide this into that and see what factor I get up here. I expect it's going to be 0 because the remainder is going to be 0 because I know this is a factor. So let's go ahead and review a little bit of long division here. So I have x squared minus 8x plus 17 goes into this polynomial. Now really I only want to look at the first term. x squared times what is going to give me x cubed? Well, it's just an x. And then I'm going to multiply this x by each of those terms and write it underneath. So x times x squared is x cubed. x times negative 8x is negative 8x squared. x times 17 is 17x. Now I'm going to subtract. Now when I subtract, I like to just add the opposite. So that makes this negative, this positive, and this negative. And then I can go ahead and add them. It's easier for me to keep track of adding than subtracting each of those terms. So go ahead and subtract. I have negative 7x and negative 17x. That gives me negative 24x. Negative 5x plus 8x, or negative 5x squared plus 8x squared gives me 3x squared. I'm going to bring down the 5 now. And then I'm going to do the same thing. x goes into 3x squared how many times? What times x squared gives me 3x squared? That's just a plus 3. Then I multiply that 3 times each of those terms, and I get 3x squared minus 24x plus 51. Then I subtract. So add the opposite. And I get 0, which I anticipated. So not only did I get 0, though, I got another factor. When I multiply this x plus 3 times this, I get back to this center thing, just like in a regular long division problem. So now I have all of my zeros, because right here I can tell my zero is going to be a negative 3. So I have negative 3, and then I have 4 plus and minus i. So those are two there, 4 plus i and 4 minus i. And I have all of my factors of this polynomial.